everybody. Welcome back to another Kite Cast. Patrick Spencer. I'm here with my co-host Tim Freestone. Tim, how are you doing? Good. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving, Patrick. Yeah, I'm back. Fat and happy. All right, good. <laughs> Ready for another 25 days until the next holiday. So yeah. we are joined by Brian Hadzik, the CTO over at NCSI. How are things out in Utah? Snow season start yet, Brian? It sure has. Matter of fact, snowing outside right now, winter weather advisory. So looking forward to putting on those skis and showing that we really do have the greatest snow on earth. So uh, thanks for having us, uh, me here on the podcast today. Appreciate it. Well, we're looking forward to this conversation. Uh, just as an introduction, Brian is an anomaly in the technology space anyway. He has been with NCSI since 2004. So Brian, a good starting point is what in the world has kept you there for 18 plus years? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I usually tell everyone I've got dirt on the boss and now he can't get rid of me. <laughs> um, but uh, no, in reality, we, you know, we have a unique uh, culture and a unique process here in NCSI. We, um, you know, everyone tries to say they do it just a little bit differently, but um, we are a very, uh, you know, family oriented organization. A lot of organizations say that, but we really believe that we follow through with that. And so um, it has uh, enabled me to you know, meet with hundreds or even thousands of customers at this point and really understand the challenges that are out there. Um, I, I really do love meeting new organizations, understanding what kind of issues and problems they have with technology, and then, you know, trying to find ways to, to solve it. And so, um, you know, I've got the best job in the world. I don't need to go anywhere. So very happy to be here um, and hope to continue that with, you know, many future years um, with NCSI, you know, understanding more about those customers and hopefully helping them achieve their goals. Now, what you guys were addressing from a problem standpoint in 2004 is dramatically different today. Uh, how have you evolved? And it was dramatically different back in 2010 and 2016, even 2018. How have you evolved the business to essentially evolve and transition, transform with uh, the problems that your customers are trying to solve in the marketplace? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And when you, when you look back that far, you realize really how far we have come. You know, it doesn't seem like ancient history, you know, in the 2000s, but, but from a technology perspective, it really is. Um, so much of the landscape has changed. And you know what? So much of it has stayed consistent. You know, we still have some of the same problems and issues that we have, but they crop up in different ways. And we have to, you know, try and solve them in different ways. Um, probably the biggest thing that I see has to do with uh, the way that we interact with our consumers of our services. So, um, you know, I come from a little bit of an ITIL background. And so the concept of a service that we provide to our end users, you know, be it email service or, um, you know, a printing service or something like that, you know, that's really changed our users' perception on technology. Think about, let's call it about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We were, we were the innovators. We brought technology to the user, you know, can you remember the first time we approached someone and said, hey, we've got this cool thing, it's called email. You know, you don't have to have memos or call people anymore. You can compose a message on this computer and send them that message and they can reply to it. You know, we, we helped innovate that, we helped create that. And, um, you know, something changed. We were the innovators and uh, we changed over time to maybe not be the ones dragging the company along, but, Companies sometimes feel like it's dragging the technology behind. Um, and really, I, I blame this, this, this device right here, the consumerization of technology, in, in this case, the iPhone um, and devices like it, it really transformed what users expect. So think about that 25 years ago. If you wanted a piece of software, you wanted to um, you know, install something, it was difficult. You had to drive to the store, you had to purchase that software, you had to put it in the computer, you had to understand the mechanics on how this works. Um, now I open up the app store and I click download. It's as simple as that. And so if a user to us comes in and says, you know, I want to synchronize my files from home. Maybe I want to work from home. I want to synchronize my files there. Um, what do we say? Well, we say no. And that's unfortunately branded us as the department of no, that we are led by the CI no. And we know why. We all know why on, you know, on this conversation here today, we got regulatory concerns. We got security concerns. We've got productivity concerns. There's lots of reasons we don't just want to go turn that on, but the user doesn't know or care about that. All they hear is, no, you can't do that. And so we shifted. We did this flip from 
we were the enablers and we were dragging technology along to where now the user thinks that we're holding them back. Well, if they would just let me synchronize my files with Dropbox, I can install Dropbox on my phone, I can install it at home, super easy to set up. What about the regulatory reasons? What about the security reasons? We know why, but they just don't want to hear that. So um, our, I think our biggest problem in technology today is that shift from us being the innovators to where our users do not believe that they are the innovators or that we're not innovating anymore and we're holding them back. So we've got to change the way that we interact with our users. We need to give them very easy to use solutions. We need to enable them to work from wherever they want to. But on the flip side, we need to provide those protections that are in place, right? You know, great, you can send our content wherever you want, but it needs to be sent through a controlled manner that we have a great audit trail and we can prove that we're complying with these various things. So that's kind of what I think has changed so dramatically over the years. You know, I was kind of joke. It's like we had a war with the end user and we didn't even know that it happened. And worse yet, we've already lost it. You know, get your average user for a company and have the CEO ask them, well, how is your technology working and what's going on? You know, especially in like the days of COVID like we're having right now, everyone works from home. Well, what if their Wi-Fi sucks and they're having issues with it? Are they going to say that's the problem? No, they're going to come back and say, well, yeah, our IT department just is not that great because everything I do is very slow. And so we've got to change our perception of that and uh, really focus on what those user drivers are and see if we can meet in the middle, like we were describing with, sure, you can have your cake and eat it too, you know, with our compliance. Yeah, and I can imagine, uh, all, that's all very fascinating, actually. And I was thinking a little bit more about the user. So the user is changing as fast as everything. These The type of user, right? So you have you have the dinosaurs like me and, and Patrick, right? And then, and then there's the Gen Y and the Gen Z and millennials. And every single generation has a different expectation of how they get through their day and, and how they allow technology to interact. So you're keeping up with business innovation and trying to keep up with user innovation and user expectations. And they're both changing very, very fast. I don't envy you. Um, how are you tackling that? So, you know, what, what are you putting in place or what strategies, especially from that user side with the, yeah. the users becoming even more and more uh, innovative in their own day-to-day -day life, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, obviously COVID threw that all out the window when mm -hmm. suddenly the way that they work is just so fundamentally changed as well. So um, really, I, I like to talk to my customers about, you know, bringing up the problem. We don't talk about it enough, to tell you the truth. We are sometimes in the ivory tower thinking, oh, well, we're doing a fabulous job here. And all complaints that the user is talking about, yeah, that's just the peasant stuff. We're not going to go worry about that. So mm -hmm. really shifting the focus, getting down on their level. You know, um, I have a customer that is a, a relatively famous uh, uh, chicken, fried chicken uh, fast food organization. Uh, you know, when, when they open up a new uh, one, they opened up one here in Utah recently, and the line was around the block for a month. Um, you know, when I met someone from the IT department one time, um, you know, they're wearing a logo shirt like I am. And it says, you know, the name of the organization. It said, oh, they're in IT operations or whatever. And then below it, it said Fry Cook. And I said, oh, that's, that's kind of funny. It says Fry Cook on there. Why does it say that? Um, and they said, well, what they do is they send their employees out to the actual restaurants themselves to learn about the business. Well, how do the Fry Cooks actually work? You know, what is the technology that's being used right there out at the edge, getting out of the ivory tower, driving down to the user and watching what the user is doing, how they're interacting with the technology. So getting down on their level and trying to get out of that kind of high point that a lot of people are and watching them do it. Oftentimes you can find fixes right then. Oh, you're doing it totally the wrong way. How come no one told you you could go and send it out this via this method? Oh, we don't have a knowledge base article for that. It's just all tribal knowledge. Okay, let's maybe try and solve that and write that down as part of a procedure or something. So getting down on that user's level is also a very helpful way to understand what they're doing. How, how do, that's an interesting point, Brian. How does that inform how you measure risk at the end of the day? Being able to get down and understand how the actual users are doing things rather than up in the ivory tower, like you just described, you're getting down in the weeds. I assume that helps inform how you measure risk and help how you work with your clients uh, and collaborate with them so they can actually determine how to measure risk down to that fried cook level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is really just understanding the business drivers behind the decision or the actions that the user is going to make. What, 
Why are they doing it that way? So the user opened up an email and just sent uh, uh, you know, communications with sensitive PII out across an unencrypted session. You know, why did they do that? Getting down on their level, you know, most of the time it's not malice or anything like that. It's that they've been tasked with, well, this is just how I've been taught to do my job or, you know, how, um, you know, I thought it was uh, supposed to be done. And so, you know, they're not necessarily doing it from a malicious perspective. Us watching that business process and realizing that we thought everyone was doing it this way, but in reality, they're doing it that way. Um, you know, simply just watching and interviewing them um, is important. And you're going to hear a lot more about things like the, the, the DEX logic. So DEX is digital experience. And so um, understanding what the, you know, maybe what latency for the user is like, what their day-to-day -day impact when services are outed, their service outages, you know, how many tickets that they've been opening, what is their bandwidth, you know, measuring all these data points of the hard data points that we can measure, and then the soft data points, like actually talking to people and asking them about it, you know, are a big part of kind of improving that. So hard data and that kind of soft data, bringing that together um, to try and, you know, see why the drivers behind that decision. was made. Yeah. And um, the, you call it DEX, digital experience matrix. Yeah, DEX, right? digital experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a lot of vendors doing more and more with it these days. Yeah. But I can imagine when you get down to that user level and their digital experience, a lot of the, um, while not meaningfully harmful activities, um, ultimately harmful activities aren't always, didn't know about it, but knew about it. It's such a bad experience. I'm going to go around it anyway, because I don't want yeah. my, as an, as a user, I don't want the user on the other side that I'm trying to use all of this with to have problems. And then we're in a, a um, productivity stall because we're trying to troubleshoot, for instance, what you said, the encryption experience from a decryption to an encryption and you know start talking about s mime and tls and pgp and everybody's eyes roll over and they start going to google and sending stuff right yeah yeah anything that causes friction for the end user to do what is in their mind their job you know is is going to be a struggle and mm -hmm. you know back to that department of no the where's the blame gonna lie it's, it's going to fall back on us that we didn't provide a frictionless experience for them. That's why they went to their personal Gmail and emailed that document out because right. they needed to get the job done. Their boss is after them to solve the problem. And so, you know, deconstructing those parts, usually we can help try and find those uh, inconsistencies in our business process, hopefully tune and tweak them to improve. Um, so springboarding off that a little bit in terms of the biggest or that being a challenge, do you, and other than just data breaches and, and information leaking being a challenge, what are you hearing from your customers as being the absolute top of mind, got to solve this in the next 16 months? Is there a, th is there a theme there that, you know, changes every 16 months and now we're in this, this theme of 16 months, right? Um, anything you see that, that threads itself throughout most of your customers that you can say, here's the, here's the next 16 months of challenges. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say it, it's probably not one thing. I'd kind of put it in two things. Mm -hmm. um, the first is the, the recovery from, um, you know, the, the concept of, you know, what was COVID? You know, wh what does the new world look like? Mm -hmm. um, gone are the days of before COVID, you know, BC. It, it, we, we need to change the way that everyone operates from a business perspective because gone are the days of everyone coming into the office for the most part and doing it the way that we did in the past, you know, so that shift to a permanent hybrid model, I think is uh, a kind of a sticking point for a lot of organizations because mm. they don't know if they're gonna be permanently remote, permanently back in the office, they kind of waffle back and forth and, you know, is our lockdowns and stuff gonna come back? We, we just don't know any of those questions. So making it so that they can say, we want to enable that hybrid, that new world of hybrid where I don't know where you're working. You might be in the office, you might not be, and kind of enabling that, I think that's probably the, the one of the biggest challenges that organizations are coming up with. Um, and then the next one is, you know, just security. Security never goes away. It is something that um, we are only getting more and more regulations. I mean, that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. You know, look at, um, you know, California just passed their, their new Consumer Privacy Act. So, it's uh, for those that aren't aware of it. It's it's not exactly like GDPR. So GDPR is a governance law that the EU enacted uh, uh, three or four years ago, 
that gives the consumer lots of privacy controls over their data. Um, an example of that is like the right to delete. If I want to go delete my account, you have to prove to me that you erased all of the data and mm -hmm. you're not just deactivating it, kind of hiding it over here. So California just passed a sort of equivalent law that's very similar to that. Um, and so we've got to match those uh, regulations. We got things like the, you know, the CMMC from the Department of Defense. Uh, we've got HIPAA regulations, all these regulations. So I now I need to compete with not only laws, but also, oh man, yeah, and the, the hackers haven't gone anywhere. They're just as aggressive as ever. Um, what are we going to do about that kind of side? So from a security perspective, that's always very, very top of mind uh, for our customers. So I would say, you know, security and figuring out what the hybrid world looks like are the two biggest challenges customers are talking about kind of over the next, you know, 12 to 16 months. Yeah, the, I, used to, uh, I started talking about our, the new calendar. Like you said, BC was before COVID and AD is after Delta, right? That's, yeah. It's sort of how we, how we live now. Everything's like anchored that. on that. Um, with the other challenge, with, with security than the two sides, I, I often say I just, I don't envy people in the security profession. There's just, because as if hackers weren't difficult enough, now it's regulations. And I was having a conversation with a CISO who had left his job in a large financial, financial institution and went to um, Carnival Cruises. And I, why did you do that? as quickly as they could regulations. It was just too much. It was, we just could not keep up. We were constantly fighting fires and, and basically all in his mind was that security had taken, or, you know, protection against the hackers had taken a back seat. Whereas in, in a less highly regulated arena, he could focus on what he enjoyed, which was protecting the organization from, you know, the, the leaking of data. Um, so with, all these new regulations coming out, I can imagine there are a lot of professionals are looking for, how do I streamline auditing and reporting and all, all that, that piece of it so I can get back to and focus on what's ultimately the biggest problem, which is data and, and breaches, yeah. data and breaches, right? Yeah, and, and that's a good uh, thing to kind of point out that those regulations, they're, they're good and they, they serve a good purpose and they, they're well-intended but in reality, far too many times they become checkboxes where, yeah. well, I just got to check that box. I got to get that auditor off my back. I don't care what it is, what it does. I just want to check that box. Whereas we need to shift our focus on that to say, well, we want, you know, compliance driven security that, you know, instead of security driven compliance, you know, we want to make sure that what our security goals are, are driving to where, well, we'll just inevitably check the box anyway, because we are complying with the product to begin with. I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with customers and you know, we'll go through a big implementation of some security product and at the end of the day, they're like, okay, great. All right, when are we meeting next? When are we gonna digest these reports? What are we gonna dive into next? Oh no, this project's done. We checked that box now. We can mm -hmm. say we comply with it. Wait, mm -hmm. Hang on, hang on, back up. Well, are you gonna continue monitoring it? Are you gonna focus on it? No, we're just going to check the box. So you know, taking a step back and saying, instead of, reading through the guidance and saying, okay, here's what the compliance I need to work on, kind of going in the opposite direction and say, well, hey, I need to comply with this, but let's take a back, step back and what should we be doing for this from a security perspective? Oh, let's go and get a product or a solution or a policy that solves these and just make sure it happens to line up with that checkbox that we need. So at the end of the day, we kind of get the best of both worlds. Yes, we're compliant, but then also we're actually using it and getting value out of the product instead of just saying, well, we checked the box and now we're there's probably a tangent here at the risk of going down it, but um, I imagine a lot of the drivers are behind checkbox strategies is just a lack of human resources to 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 go further because they've got seven more checkboxes ahead of them yep. that they need to uh, you know. So we're into that whole resource problem in 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 security. Um, I'm not going to ask you how to solve it, but it's just kind of <laughs> interesting. You know, again, back to the CISO I was talking about, it just, all he was doing was chasing checkboxes. And I'm sure he didn't want to. It's just, he had only so many resources and a whole mountain of checkboxes ahead of him. Even now with um, with the third-party risk um, industry, you know, I sat with a couple analysts who, uh, who were focused on third-party risk and they were frustrated because of almost the exact same thing you said was they would get through 
like where's the data how secure is the data in your third party what you know how do they protect it what are all of the technologies they have in place get all of your check boxes get the report pass the regulation and you're done it's like no you're not done you <laughs> once the data starts to move into that third party you <laughs> You got to assume breach. You got to assume that even though they've gone through your check mark or your checklist of third party risk, that you still need to protect the data. You still need to control it because it's yours. They're just on loan. It's just, just on loan, right? Um, so I think that, you know, just again, what's the, how do you go past the checkbox of regulation and into proactively managing risk because of it, right? Yeah, it's also a difficult problem when we start talking about things like staffing. So staffing is still a concern. Um, and most of the customers I talk with, you know, the job market yeah. is still very tight. And security is kind of a, a special unit in and of itself. And a lot of people that want to get into security, they love the, you know, the deep technical and, you know, the real nuts and bolts of what's going on. They don't care about regulations. That's not their jam. They, di they didn't get into it because, you know, they're like, oh, I can't wait till I can fill out this form for our compliance and talk to auditors. That's not what they got into it. They said, you know, oh, I saw the movie from the 90s, Hackers, and I want to be like that, you know. So um, the people that get into it also are not what I would consider very audit compliance driven. They're driven for the exciting technical reasons of it. So, you know, another mm -hmm. reason when you hand it to an end user or your security team, they're always going to prioritize kind of the more exciting things versus some of the more uh, meat and potatoes or, you know, the basics, blocking and tackling that we need to focus on. That we're skipping over that to get to the exciting stuff. Um, so, no, I don't have a magic answer for that. If I did, I'd write a book and, you know, be a millionaire. But, right. um, you know, I think our, our bigger concern and what we need to do is take one step back from those regulations and see how we could drive the business drivers towards those regulations instead of just putting the regulations on top and checking the one box. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a difficult task to accomplish because it requires a lot more foresight. And it's not just, well, I got this regulation for CMMC. How do I check that box? It's, no, let's really read through it. I mean, how many people have read through these? Have you ever read through the, the PCI or HIPAA laws? There are dozens and dozens of pages, the most boring legal techno babble ever. They're difficult to understand, but taking a step back and, you know, understanding what the bigger picture looks like um, is usually a, a way to help try and solve that. Now, where do you build the compliance conversation into the customer journey methodology that you have as an organization? Uh, yeah. you know, some IT service management approach, managed service. When do you strike up? They probably are coming to you in most instances trying to talk about cybersecurity. When do you introduce the compliance angle or is the compliance angle coming up initially and then the cybersecurity conversation follows afterwards? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, specifically, that customer journey, at least that we talk about, is this concept that we've unfortunately gotten maybe a little bit too crass in specifically like the reseller space where, you know, the important part is evaluate, you know, having a problem, evaluating solutions, purchasing that solution, and then riding off into the sunset, right? Well, we don't see that as the journey. We see the customer journey as the understanding of the problem and the adapting of a tool to help solve that problem. That's just the very start. Um, you know, the concept of reevaluating over time and seeing if it still meets our business drivers um, you know, going through continuous improvement. Well, yeah, we've got it installed. We've got it configured. But you know what? Adding this process or controlling that process would be better to, you know, meet this particular audit requirement or, you know, understand this uh, particularly about the regulation. You know, going through that continual improvement and putting it back in production and figuring out what you can do to improve upon that process and putting it through UAT and testing and then putting that into production again. You know, it's always kind of a continuous life cycle of our various solutions that we have out there. Um, most of our customers are, are thinking about regulation right at the start. You know, they don't usually come up with that after the fact. Um, and that's because we're all kind of stuck in the way that we've been talking about for a while now, that those regulations are huge drivers for us. They come from up high, they come from the CIO, from our legal counsel, et cetera, and tell us that we need to meet these particular requirements. And the very first thing is, well, let me just Google this CMMC, CMMC thing as an example and see what vendors can help me provide that. Um, I wish that we could get our customers to, you know, again, take a step back and, 
and I know it sounds crazy, but read through the thing and understand a little bit more about what's going on. Don't just take some vendor's word for it, but actually read what it says. Even though it's full of legalese and so forth, we can parse through it, better understand what, you know, potentially what the goals behind that are. You know, you don't read that in the headline of the regulation. You read that, you know, on line item number 426 saying, here's why we're trying to accomplish this particular problem and what it's attempting to solve. Understanding that problem, mapping that problem to what our business looks like. Do we have that problem? Is, is that particular issue happening? Um, do we need to comply with it? Um, you know, as crazy as it sounds, maybe stop doing it that way. If, you know, your problem is that you're not sending secure faxes, which uh, fax machines, I wish we could kill off, but the technology that won't go away. What's that again? <laughs> fax machines, yeah. So um, uh, we can't kill them off. And if the answer is, well, you're not sending secure fax machines, I don't want you to see going and buying a secure fax machine product. Take a step back evaluate why you're sending out fax messages and see if we can realign the way that we do business instead so that we can just ignore that regulation and say not applicable. You know, not applicable is a get out of jail free card when it comes to regulations. There's no reason we can't slightly change our business process in order to fix that. Now, you got to be careful with that. Uh, you don't want to, you want a bank that's not, uh, can't be robbed, you know, bolt the door shut, brick in all the windows and never let anyone inside the building. Well, we can't do that. You can't operate a bank if you've never let customers inside. So we have to accept that risk. Let's just try and understand what that risk is and maybe, you know, change the way that it behaves. And so purely understanding what those regulations are asking for, seeing what our business process is first, then arriving at, okay, maybe let's look to see if there's a piece of software or a vendor out there that solves this problem instead of jumping straight to that. They, they read through the regulations, they Google that regulation, there's an ad at the top that says, we fix this problem. Okay, show me what it looks like. Well, no, take a step back, evaluate what your business process is. The, um, that risk problem, the, it's, that's kind of, that's gotta be the most complex because every customer is different, right? What's your threshold for risk? Is, is it here, is it here? What are the, the, the elements that, uh, in, increase risk, decrease risk to get to your threshold. You start out a lot with defining, trying to artic get a customer to articulate their risk threshold and then architecting around getting them to that point because you can't secure, security, being secure isn't a thing. <laughs> there's always going to be, there's just always going to be a, a hacker or a pen tester or somebody that can get through. It's why that whole industry exists. So, it's all about what's the risk threshold that you're trying to to accomplish. Is, is you, would you agree with that? Sort of getting at like project management 101. What's the goal? How do we get there? It, so if you can't align on on the goal, and for me, I just I can't find any other answer besides your risk threshold as a company. Then you can't you know roadmap to it. It's just more of like, would you agree with that kind of statement? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and understanding that risk. Is, is something that is not well enough thought out when organizations are looking at technologies. Yes, um, that's what I mean. They, it they, seems like they just go right to the tech. I need this yeah. tech stack. Yeah, well, yeah absolutely. Uh, I, first, right? I, I need this regulation covered. Let me buy this software problem solved. But you're absolutely right. Getting them to understand that they have to be able to calculate it. And, and I love, going through thought exercises. I, I think that gets people really thinking about it quite a bit. Um, so I love to bring them up in, in my conversations with my customers and just say, hey, let's do a thought exercise. Let's think about it for a second. One of my favorites to do is things like, um, as it deals with data breaches, let's pretend for a second that your organization has a data breach and you've got 500,000 um, customers, you've got a million customers or you know, whatever it ends up being. Um, I want you to pretend for a second how much are you going to pay in stamps to send a letter to a million people that you lost their data? Just the stamp. Now, I'm not even talking about the envelope or the printing or anything like that. What's a postal stamp these days? I don't even know. Is it 60 cents or something I like that? I just bought some this weekend a lot. <laughs> yeah. So now you have to buy a million of them because you just had a data breach. How much is their 60 cents stamp times a million dollars? So when you go through exercises like that of of thought exercises, I think it can start to get the gears turning with our customers and with employees inside the organization that don't want to think about risk and security. It's, 
you know, it's like, I don't know, death and taxes. People don't want to talk about those either, or maybe religion and politics. You don't want to bring it up. You don't want to talk about it. That's a real bummer, right? No, we've got to talk about it. And let's bring in those maybe a little bit more casual conversations to get everyone talking about it. I want 10 people in a room, and I want to go through that thought exercise with them. I don't want the one risk person there to think about it. I want everyone to be thinking about that. Then everyone can say, oh, wait, yeah, you're right. That'd be $60 million in stamps that we'd have to buy. That makes a lot more sense while we're putting in a system that's going to help protect our data. Or, you know, what about the reputational impact that would be associated with it? Let's pretend for a second that all of our user data was posted onto the internet. What's going to happen to us as an organization And what are the ramifications associated with that? So instead of trying to get all these really complicated risk terms around it, I find that these kind of thought exercises bring a little more casual attitude to it and get everyone thinking about it. And hopefully we can come to a little bit more correct assumption or correct decisions because we got everyone thinking about those risk calculations. Um, But yeah, most organizations don't do a great job. They skip that over that and they go straight to, um, you know, how do I solve this problem? Or they kind of flip-flop it. They say, well, risk uh, management is absolutely part of our decision-making capabilities. We have a problem. We interview vendors. We decide on which one we're going to purchase. Then we run it through this risk calculation just to make sure that the vendor is valid and they follow all the rules and regulations and so forth. No, no, no. Right. Take a step back. Risk mm-hmm. is not just at that point. It needs to happen before you pick up the phone and call your first vendor. Yeah, yeah. And a lot, lot of um, – to what degree do you – see like uh, technology of the month playing into people's in the IT security professionals strategy. So zero trust, for instance, you know, it's, and I wouldn't say it's of the month, it's of the decade because it seems to just like not go anywhere. Although it did evolve to some degree from a marketing buzzword to an actual strategy. But do you see uh, companies and customers saying, I need this because this is what the market is telling me to do in order to better improve my security posture and lower my risk, um, you know, in using zero trust as a, as a specific there, right? Do you see that happening? Yeah, unfortunately I do. And really it, it boils down to the fact that, you know, most of our customers, they have a full-time job. They've got to work 40 hours a week, you know, doing whatever it is in IT that they're doing, keeping the wheels turning and keeping the, you know, the bus moving along. They don't have time to read books. They don't have time to research, do read research papers and things like that. And so they don't get a great way to step back and say, I want to understand what's changing in the world. You know, zero trust, you, you pointed it out. It's just such a big buzzword. I've, every other call I get on with a customer, they bring up zero trust. And I put it right back on them. What, what does that mean to you? What, what does zero trust? That's more of a philosophy than it is a product. And don't get me wrong. I like it. I like the concept of zero trust. Um, you know, there's just, we need to stop trusting things that we inherently trusted before. We need to stop trusting our users and what the, they do with our data that they are inherently correct when they are maybe not. But yes, you're absolutely right that it is the buzzword of the month or the year or, you know, geez, we're probably four or five years into zero trust and it's probably going to hang on for another couple of years. And then AI or something will come up. Machine learning was it for a while. AI machine learning. Everyone asked about it. But no one could even describe what that meant or what they were trying to do with it. And it kind of fizzled away a little bit and we, we switched over to zero trust. So, um, yes, I agree that that is a, a pretty big problem that we're falling into the marketing too much. Um, zero trust, I didn't see it exist as a product or e- even as a grouping of products. And then people just started kind of pushing it and taking product X and bringing, oh, that's zero trust. Oh, product Y, that's zero trust. Well, why? Because you named it that? Or was it truly trying to tackle the tenets of that philosophy that says, you know, we don't trust even our own employees with their information or with their data. We are going to segregate and, you know, make sure that they are, um, you know, not just given carte blanche access to everything. So I, I agree with the philosophies that, things like zero trust in principle, but yes, marketing just got a hold of that and just is now shoving it down everyone's throat. And it's not necessarily the right, the, even the right answer for a lot of people. Do you think zero trust applies to how you control and manage your content? Is that applicable? Well, I believe it does. Um, zero trust, 
oftentimes, the majority of the times rather, is uh, really applied to the connectivity for the most part. When a user, or is a user VPNing in, or are we sending them up to the cloud and they have access to a, something up in the cloud and then it tunnels back to our office? Or, you know, gone are the days of when I turn on my VPN or plug into the office, I get everything, every server, every IP address, it's just, you know, completely open to me. We're going to start segregating and firewalling that off. So Zero Trust today and in the past, most people associate with networking and networking related style activities. We need to take that same philosophy and that philosophy is we don't trust even people who we thought we maybe trusted before. That's the philosophy of zero trust. We need to apply that to uh, our data. And that's not where a lot of people are talking. A lot of people are talking about networking. I want to change it so they are talking about the data because how do we know that that user, again, it doesn't have to be malicious. We don't always have to look at it from a malicious angle. It could be accidental. It could be just to get around our controls that we put in place. We need to have zero trust around data. I do not trust you with all of the data that our organization creates because all of it's, a lot of it's consumer oriented data, right? I do not trust you to send that wherever you want, whenever you want, and have you, the end user, be the steward of the security of that data. We can't do that anymore. We need yeah, to have yeah. a zero trust policy. You're getting into our um, a little bit into our stump speech because I, I totally agree. It's that there's this um, uh, you know access zero trust access to the network. Okay, check. Then within the network, there's applications zero trust to the application. So the network and the application layer still technology. Like, well, what about the data that's the whole point of those two layers? <laughs> Is lit. Nobody breaks into applications for the application itself. I won't say nobody. I guess somebody could st steal code and, and then it would be IP, but it's all about the data. So ap sure, apply it at the network and the, the, the application layer, but also the data, also the content. So that if the content gets out of the, the, the net, out of the applications and out of the network, you still have zero trust around that piece of content, right? That, you know, for lack of a better word, follows it. And then you really, it's again, back to reducing risk, reduce the risk to the level that you possibly can, right? Um, yeah. So the three- yeah, Our three users are, are our business drivers are, we need to get that content out to the right people. Mm -hmm. um, in classic models, it's all up to the user. You know, mm -hmm. please don't send our entire customer list with every social security number um, out to someone's Gmail account. Pretty please don't. Right. You know, that, that's our old model behind it. You know, now we can come back and say, no, the, the data is everything. You know, when we're talking about data breaches and things like that, nobody cares how many workstations got malware installed on right. them and whatever. Yeah. It's the data. The data is everything. And so just like you described, I like the concept of, you know, we're sending this data out into the world, but we're putting a shield around it. We're putting rules and controls and regulations and audit trails around that data. So when it goes out, we can ensure Never is it going to be perfect, just like you right. described. You cannot make an it. unhackable right. system. Right. You can unplug everything. That's a pretty good step towards it, but we can't do that. So, you know, having it go out into the world and say we put as best controls on, on it as we can. Yeah, good, good, good. A lot of the compliance regulations you see arising are wanting you to demonstrate proof that that actually happened. Are your clients coming to you and asking you not only to get those controls in place, but to be able to demonstrate that they have them when they're audited for HIPAA, they're audited for GDPR, they're audited for CCPA, or, you know, we're going to have, what, another four individual state laws go into effect this year that are all related to data privacy to be able to demonstrate compliance with each of those. You know, what, what, what transpires when clients talk to you about these issues? Yeah, uh, and you point out kind of a, a, a really terrible problem that we're having that now I have four, one of them here in Utah, I was just reading up on those data privacy laws, we're going to get to the point where you're going to have to read through 50 of them and make sure you match them just in the United States. And they're all um, going to yes. be different. <laughs> right. and they're all going to be different, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and that really stems back to um, something when it comes to these kind of regulations. It almost, almost doesn't matter if we actually implemented the security. You know, I always talked about this back when we started to do a lot of full disk encryption on our laptops. Um, you know, when we were talking to customers, we would make kind of a funny statement that was true, but unless they really thought about it, we didn't notice it. And, and the kind of the idea behind it is 
it is irrelevant if that hard drive is encrypted. It doesn't matter. I don't care. It is irrelevant. It is incredibly important if you can prove that it was encrypted. Because if it was encrypted, but you can't prove it, you're going to have to tell every regulator, can't prove it. What, it, it might as well be not effective. So that audit trail that we have is hugely important. It's not just, well, that's a nice log that I can spit out in the back end. No, the audit trail is essentially the reason that we're doing it or, or the proof that we have done it. So um, I really emphasize that with our customers. Not a lot of them start with that as a huge driver. And I hopefully help try and convince them of that. Say, you know, again, those thought exercises, let's pretend for a second that, you know, this uh, drive wasn't encrypted. What do you, how are you going to prove that it was encrypted? So the audit trails are only a more important, more and more important thing in those kind of regulations. Does that apply when it comes to cyber insurance? Um, absolutely. Yeah. When you're coming back and you're uh, getting your cybersecurity insurance, um, for those that haven't been paying attention, those rates have gone through the roof. I've heard as much as five to 10 times as expensive um, to get cybersecurity insurance. And you have to prove to the insurance company. I mean, this, this isn't something that was happening before. Insurance companies, you know, in the past, they're like, okay, how many employees do you have? And, you know, oh, how many buildings do you own? And things like that. They've started kind of to wise up to it. That's, oh, if we're going to be proving, giving you cybersecurity insurance, as an example, and you've got a big ransomware attack, we're going to have to pay out that ransom. That's what the insurance is there for, right? So now, just like when you go get health insurance, they don't just say who you are. You need to get a blood test. You got to check your cholesterol levels, all things like that. And that's going to adjust your rates. So uh, insurance vendors are starting to realize this and they're asking questions of, okay, do you have um, an EDR solution? What are you doing with secure email messaging? How does your backup work? And it relates to air gap. And so right now we're having to prove what we're doing as it relates to that. Um, and a lot of people in IT don't care about that. They, insurance, who cares? Whatever, that's not my department, not my job. Um, but the rates are going to be astronomical. We need to partner with whoever deals with that risk management or legal or whoever in our organization is dealing with that. And we need to say, hey, how can we help drive down this cost? You know, we've got some great examples of customers saving millions of dollars on their insurance premiums by buying technology that checks some of those boxes that the insurance companies are, are asking. Well, I don't know if I have anything else, Patrick. So if you got any more up your sleeve, that was uh, very informative on my side. Yeah, I had one more question for Brian. We're here near the end of 2022. As you look out to 2023, you gave us two things that are top of mind for your clients today. What are some things that you think we're not talking that much about right now? Uh, as we go into 2023, there'll be more and more conversations around those items. Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, I know that uh, there is a forecast report that you guys have been putting out um, that's talking about kind of some of the trends and so forth that are happening. And and there was one thing on there that I think is is really worth thinking about and talking about and bringing up more with customers and and, you know, again, having those thought exercises about it. And it has to do with um, the concept that we deal with so many vendors. You know, you, you cannot be a business in today's uh, economy and not use technology. You know, um, I went into uh, my brother's uh, cabinet business. So he, he builds cabinets for a living, you know, builds wooden cabinets and puts them in kitchens, does a great job. And um, I went in and talked to him. He's like, well, why are all your guys standing around? Something was wrong. Everyone's just standing there. Oh, yeah, our computer system that, that handles the CNC machine for that is not working. And the scheduling system over there is not working. He couldn't get it working for a couple of days. All of his guys were standing around there idle. And it really pinpointed the fact that he is not a cabinet maker. He's a technology company that happens to cut wood. You know, technology has permeated everything that we do. So a business has to rely on technology. They call up Microsoft to host their Office 365. They call up VMware to host their, or Amazon and uh, you know, Google or uh, Azure to host their, their virtual machines and things like that. We deal on vendors every single day, all day. It's what, something we've been doing for the past, you know, everything in technology. But the problem is that gives you, you're essentially handing your keys over to the, the vendor in a, in a, uh, in a, conceptual stance that they are now responsible for security. How do you secure Office 365? I sure hope Microsoft is doing it. That's what I'm paying them to do, right? Are they? Maybe I ought to go read the manual or call it my Microsoft guy. You know, it's a complex problem. 
So in that report, they talk about one thing specifically, and it has to deal with encryption keys. I think this is a really under the covers, no one's talking about it, and I want to bring it more to the forefront. Um, and that's the concept of not completely trusting your vendors. Zero trust. We do not trust our employees, but we have complete and utter trust in our vendors. Wait a minute. You know, that, that's not right. So the concept of getting tools and things like that, that we can still have the encryption keys, that we can actually guarantee that if one of our third-party vendors has a breach or has an attack or something like that, that we are not thrown under the bus for what our vendor did. If we can control those encryption keys, fine, I don't care. Their software was breached. They got on the server. doesn't matter. Everything's encrypted, and that vendor never had a key, so they cannot get our data back. I think you're going to see a lot of big push around things like that so that when we send our data out into the world and we interact with these vendors that we are paying large amounts of money to, if they have a data breach or if they have a problem like that, it's not going to neg negatively impact us because we can say, hey, all the data was encrypted and we stored the keys, you didn't, you know, problem solved. So I think that's going to be a big up and coming thing that a lot more people are going to be talking about. We certainly agree with that. Well, we could go on for uh, another 40 minutes, I suspect, Brian, but uh, time is up. Uh, we'll let you go uh, check out the slopes. Appreciate that. Thanks again for your time, guys. Great conversation. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, we appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us. For anyone who would like to check out other KiteCast episodes, you can do so at KiteWorks.com slash KiteCast.